So tonight we're lucky to have uh, James Coulson give the final real lecture of the Durability in Architecture series for the trimester. Uh, James is a graduate of Deakin University and has been teaching at the school since 94, um, before much of us were conceived, let alone born, I'm sure. Um, he'd previously worked in... Uh, <laughs> you never know, it might have something to do with someone. Uh, he has previously worked in London for Dennis Lasden uh, and is famous for his teaching of documentation, studio and referencing tennis wherever possible in his lectures. James has an interest in renewable materials and sustainable construction, implicit knowledge analysis in architectural communication and relating project specification, specific information and professional knowledge. Uh, tonight will be, well I thought it was a crowning lecture but he's giving a doc one next uh, week at the school and it is appropriately being held on the day the working drawings for document documentation studio are due. Uh, I'm sure many in here will be, <laughs> yeah, will be struggling to keep their eyes open, however there's none better to keep us awake over the next hour. Uh, I could listen to James discuss structure and tectonics all day, so please welcome James Coulson. Okay, I've been told not to wander about. Uh, thank you very much, Ned, for that uh, very kind introduction. And thank you to all of you for turning up. Um, I'm a bit nervous, actually. Uh, and it feels really weird, if you're wondering. It does feel strange, getting to this point. Um, so I'm going to do a bit of reflecting. Um, the details in the background are probably giving some of you nightmares at the moment, those in Project Doc. Um, they're from a house I built uh, a long time ago, but I'm not really going to talk about that. Um, wow. <laughs> well, I did say this card must be carried at all times, so I've still got it. <laughs> I, you know, follow the rules. Um, so, yeah, the ability to withstand wear, pressure and damage, that's the definition of durability, which is the theme for this semester. Um, so it's probably fitting that I'm still still standing, um, but there are signs of wear and tear, definitely. Uh, this is what I got from Ned, this was the provocation. Um, there won't be an exam on this at the end, so you don't have to memorise it, but there was quite a few things in there that I thought about. Um, probably the top one, thinking about tectonics, um, has become a real interest of mine because it weaves together uh, things that I suppose I like doing and maybe have been good at but also as a way of explaining the complexity of weaving those things together to, to students and I suppose that's the thing that I've had to learn to do. Uh, no one taught me how to be an academic. There was no course. You just got a job and you started teaching. Someone gave you a unit to run. Um, which in actually 1993 is when I started full time. Uh, that was Project Doc. So I continued to teach that until Michael Sharman came along and elbowed me out of the way. Not quite. Um, but I actually started prior to that from about 1987. I was doing part time work um, for my old lecturers basically when they went on long service leave. Um, you might have heard Tony Arnell if you went to the awards night talking of Bob Moore. Um, I used to help Bob Moore with building technology um, because I was a bit of a devotee of solar energy with Bob Moore at the time as a student. And so when they knew I was about, uh, they called me in to do off-campus marking and some things like that. Um, and I must have liked it enough, I think. I was kind of running my own small practice at the time, working on another small practice at an ocean grove and getting some buildings built but I think I probably liked the idea of influencing larger numbers rather than the small number of buildings I might build in a career. And I had a first year lecturer, Philip Gibbs, who said much the same thing and I remembered it for some reason. And so I think it grew on me. All right, so I'm just going to go through, um, I, I guess, a bit of a discussion about things I see when I travel and look at interesting architecture. Uh, with the help of Kevin Huey most recently, 
in Finland in 2016 um, and just stop me when the hour's up because we don't want the pizza to get cold, do we, Stuart? <laughs> Did you get that case of red, Des? Uh, no. You didn't? <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing here then? I'm trying to keep my job. <laughs> You could be like me. <laughs> uh, okay. This is all you get to work with, really. Um, space comes for free. So it's only the bit that you stick around the space that counts. That's what costs all the money. And that's what requires all the detail because um, you can't really mess too much with the air. And for me, there's just five simple things that you try and do. You know, just touch the ground, meet the sky, make the plane, turn the corner and form the opening. Um, that covers most things. Anyone sitting there thinking there's something extra? I'm quite happy to add one. I've, I've got this view on lifelong learning. I'm happy to add to the slide. There's, there's space there. I could push that up and add another one. I always ask that question. The Meet the budget. <laughs> no, that's far too hard. <coughs> Leave that to Tony Mills. Leave that to Tony Mills. All right. Um, and then the only way we can engage with this is through our perceptual systems. There is no other way. So if we factor that in, um, I like to think in terms of relating the spatial fabric to the body, somatic detail, uh, just as a way of uh, enriching that previous list. Um, there are better writers on the subject than me. Um, so you're getting into behavioural science, um, but certainly Yuhani Palasma, I think, um, is worth looking at to understand this relationship between uh, body and the built environment. And another little book that I came across a while back by Flora Samuel um, on Corb and looking at the detail in Corb and talking about Corb's interest in the body and how uh, he understood buildings as being uh, basically palaces of pleasure for the senses. Did you say that once, Des, and I've remembered it? Have you written it down? I'm down. Oh, okay. So I go to uh, buildings and I, I guess I see detail. Uh, you'd all be familiar with Charles Rennie McIntosh? A few people nodding, not everybody. Uh, I just think that's a beautiful elevation, uh, the composition of this arts and crafts building in Helensborough. It's a National Trust property, so you can go and visit. Uh, you're probably more familiar with his ladder back chair. Yeah, you can, you can buy repros of them. Um, he spent a lot of time on the furniture, but I also think he spent a lot of time on that elevation. And if I can get my cursor to go the right way, yes. Uh, I just love the little windows, the one that meets the door frame and then the one that floats free out here. And just the playfulness of that elevation. And yet, <coughs> it's in a language that's related to traditional Scottish architecture, which was also what he was trying to do, to make this part of the location. But I also think it's completely modern. And so I think it's masterful. I'm still not sure about the white downpipe. There you go. Anyone else see anything they don't like? The vent. Yes, yeah, poking out the top. All right. Good. So you guys see detail as well. And go to Ronchamp and, yeah, I enjoy the overall form, but I tend to walk around the back and immediately see the handrail on the stair and go, it looks like a deformed railway track. Or someone's somehow managed to shave the top bit off on one side. And I wonder about things like that. It might be a special section they got rolled, but I'd be surprised. So I'm wondering where that came from. But I see that. I don't just see the 
you know, sculptural aspect of the steel, I actually see the cross section of the steel. <coughs> so I'm a bit weird. Um, but that's why I'm good in Project Doc. And I just love the little stair, you know, the whole idea that you can hold the stair like that. Maybe the railway section should have banked corner. I, I, yeah, I thought about it. I thought, oh, I can't say that. So I go, no. What's it banked corner? <laughs> they make trains go around slowly so that doesn't happen, Des. It's not like you're in the BMW. The yellow one goes faster. <laughs> and then I go to the bookshop by Alto in uh, Main Street in Finland, Helsinki. And I go, three door handles, you know, one for every height. And that you'd articulate that and not just make one big <coughs> one that everyone can grab onto. Or maybe you started with one and there were complaints. <laughs> So I see that. I also see the fixings. And go to Chiasma, also in Helsinki, and yeah, I enjoy the building and you know, lunch and so on. But I immediately notice the little guy, you know, playing on the monkey bars. And go, yeah, I think Stephen Hull's got a sense of humour. And yeah, this, why would you carry the handrail past where you know where you don't need it. Well just for fun. Maybe. And so I can go anywhere and see stuff. Um, isn't near that wonderful? Do you know where we are? Yeah. Thank you, Mark. And I thought I'd start in a little bit of detail on this project here. Because um, I went to France to play tennis in 2015. Tennis is good, you know, the tournament's there and so you go there and then you, you find stuff. Uh, and up on Montmartre, when you look out over the bit that they're looking after compared to the bit that they're not looking after, uh, you go, how'd they get away with that? 1977, maybe only in the 70s you could get away with it. But from that kind of distance, it's kind of not obscene. Is <laughs> <laughs> uh, a distance that it's obscene from, do you think? Ah, uh, well, I just think the idea that they were able to break the height limit and... Yeah, it's obscene, isn't it? Everyone else has behaved. <laughs> trying to provoke an argument, come on, guys. <laughs> Ned will pass the microphone around. Uh, from this distance, though, uh, on the Seine, on, on the bridge passing over, uh, it actually isn't that offensive. Because <laughs> the buildings here are closer, and I managed to take a photo, and I thought, actually, that's not too bad. Um, then you get into Plaza, and it's just it's magnificent. And just this whole idea that the structure is exposed. And this, and I try hard to get people in resolution to expose the structure and do something with it. I think we should just send everyone there, Des, and get them to do a measured drawing. <laughs> what do you reckon? Yeah, yeah. And the bracing. Do you think I can get the students in Project Doc to actually declare where they've put their bracing? Because I go, is that a brace frame? They go, yeah, it's a brace frame. So where's the bracing? <laughs> can you tell me? <laughs> where should I put it? Um, yeah, so the articulation of the frame, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Because uh, it's, it's not a building in plan. I mean, it's just, that's it. It's just, you know, utter repetition and system. But the expression of it and the gesture to put the escalators outside the structure and hang them in the plaza, so every time you go up and down a level, because all the other levels are the same, yeah, so you go back out, you know where you are again. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's brilliant. But it's such a simple plan. And it only takes up half the space, which is the other brilliant bit, because it's the space in front of it that allows you to appreciate it. 
and everyone congregates there. And, you know, they play didgeridoos. In fact, you can, you can do didgeridoo lessons in Paris. And then other people just come and watch the other people. And so it's a fantastic place of congregation. But that gesture of putting people to the outside, uh, it does get a bit hot in summer in those escalators, but uh, you look, get to look out over Paris as you go up. You don't really look at the Pompidou Centre because it's a bit grubby close up. But the cast gerberets, the expression of the structure, and the amount of detail that's gone into the articulation of the bits, just it just feels like a skeleton to me, which I really enjoy. But you can see already it's difficult to keep something white. You know, you wear a white shirt and it's grubby by lunchtime. Well, mine usually is if I wear one. I've had the bolognese for lunch. So there are issues with putting the skeleton on the outside of the skin. <coughs> and they've tried to deal with it. But every time you punch through, uh, that's difficult to seal and can get a bit untidy. Um, and any ledge or surface you put there is perfect for pigeons. They just go, thank you. And of course, then they poop on the top and then that washes down to the bottom and it sets again and the organic staining from any muck in the air or what washes down the building all accumulates. And so you've got to go around cleaning it or putting nets up to try and stop the birds from perching. Bez likes that bracing, yes. Yeah. Oh, he's nice bracing. Okay, go on, keep going. Yeah. I reckon it looks a little bit oversized, but I'm sure the engineers would have done it carefully. Yeah, maybe it's working hard at the end there for some reason. I'm not sure. And, you know, white's a good surface for graffiti artists. And blue's not very good in the UV. So it's fading. Because <coughs> I'm talking about durability, aren't I? Yeah? So, you know, you've got to clean this building as often as Des cleans his yellow BMW. Is that netting hanging over? Yeah, they've got netting everywhere to keep the birds off. It's so unfortunate. Uh, it works well inside. Um, the stairs hang from way up there and, th and they don't rock about because I'm not sure they really need the cables, but they look pretty cool. And the colours don't fade. Uh, and it's all exposed, so everything's got to be thought about. And I struggled to find stuff that hadn't been thought about on the inside, um, which I think is pretty good for the high-tech architects because you know, sometimes they forget something and it just shows yeah, when you do naked stuff. And boy, was I lucky <laughs> when I went there. Yeah, it's Corb. <laughs> so... I was going to say pig and shit, but no, I was in clover. <laughs> and of course, there's the preemptive idea for this open structure and changing architecture to what we would call modern architecture. And he drew big elevations. I'm pretty sure it's about 1 to 50. It could even be bigger. It might even be 1 to 25. Hard to remember now. But just that you would test it that, that carefully, draw it, draw it that big. Once again, like we tell everyone to do in Arc Design and Resolution. Uh, it was a great exhibition, and I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, 
So I went to Villa Savoy. It's just, there's the Seine again. Um, it's just western end of the centre sort of area of um, Paris. It's the last train station. So you just walk up from the train station up the hill and go into Villa Savoy. Um, it used to have a commanding position looking down over the Seine when it was built. That was the idea. Um, but someone decided to build a school around it. And it nearly got knocked down. Uh, you get a sense of the use of the roof garden, one of the main principles. And yes, there's a little caretaker's residence which has been uh, re re remodeled or, f or fixed up. It's been uh, conserved. Um, and the landscape kind of isolates it in a nice garden, but I'm pretty sure the original was a bigger area. Um, it's a stunning elevation. And I think uh, it's durable in that sense because it's an image which I think once you study it, it sort of doesn't go away. And most people recognise it. But as Des and I often say, yeah, that was designed around the same time as that chariot. And that's why it's amazing. Because people were still driving versions of you know, horse-drawn carriages with kind of lantern windows, uh, lantern uh, headlights, like you used to have on the carriages. And so it was kind of ahead of what else was going on. Um, and the whole idea around the plan was that you arrived by car. So Corb was kind of up with what was going on. And that you drive the car around the plan. You engage, you don't just sort of drive into a, you know, double garage door, lifts up and comes down. So you drive around, you park like you're in a street. And then you go into the building. So the circulation and the idea of kind of promenade starts with the recognition of the way you arrive. <coughs> and I just love that integration because, you know, most of us still put the car over there and you get out of the car and then you go into the architecture. Not in all cases, but still quite common. So I enjoyed that. And then the whole idea that you put ramps inside a house rather than stairs. And so the whole idea of the promenade through the space means that you're not kind of watching your step, so you can actually look around. And so you can take in the detail. And that continues up onto the roof. And that was an important part of those five points of architecture, is that you regain the garden that you'd taken away by putting the floor plate there, <coughs> rather than just putting, you know, tiles on a roof. And so that's a significant kind of recreation space and you can look out over the landscape. What would you give as in Design Red for the tile layout on the landing, Jack? Uh, not too good. Not too good. That corner's missed and yeah, for a significant point, and, and yeah, it doesn't line up the other way, does it, Des? No, that wouldn't go too well. <laughs> We're assuming it's original. But the rest of it, the rest of it might get him over the line. Ah, uh, yeah, there, yeah, yeah, just yeah, fair pass. Yeah. Fair, fair pass. <laughs> and the whole idea that you just slide the wall back. Um, we think we do al fresco now. Um, and Corb was doing it then. Uh, it's quite amazing how that space just flows outside and you just you just walk outside. It's wonderful. Or you sit inside and you look outside because of the height of the windows. Um, so having given it a big tick, it, it does have its problems. This whole idea that's the original construction down here and 1960 up there when it was nearly uh, knocked over to make the school. I I'm trying to remember who got heavily involved to save it. Would it have been John Prouvé? Would he still been alive? 
I'm trying to think who got oh, involved. Yeah, yeah, the main judge of the competition. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's an interesting book um, on different projects, but it includes a discussion about the process uh, through the, the life of this building and w what happened about resurrecting it. But of course, it's got that problem that we all understand, don't we? A concrete frame and then infill construction and any kind of differential movement, shrinkage, whatever, between those two systems, you're going to get cracks in any render you put on the wall. Um, and so there's renovation required. You can see here, I've taken a photo, that's my photo uh, from 2015, showing w what goes on. Um, and of course, the steel windows, they all just want to rust. Yeah, so there's significant maintenance issues with kind of getting these uh, uh, lines, these horizontal and, and fine lines in the architecture. There is a great photo published of it when the Nazi had taken over Paris and there's a tractor park in the laundry. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen that image, Des. Yeah. Oh, okay. Not very flattered. How'd they get it in the laundry? Any way they want. <laughs> Um, yeah, so uh, it, it's it's durable as an image, but uh, in terms of building, it's going to require a lot of upkeep. Um, back to the uh, exhibition, I was surprised at the merchandising. So Corb was up with a lot of things. He was a head of car design, and he was right into merchandising. So his dimensional system, the modular, you could just buy it. You could buy a little, you know, like film canisters with rulers and... Yeah, I was absolutely amazed. And the amount of publication, his ability to actually get himself published, uh, was phenomenal. And I still think his ceiling height's a bit low. 2260, pretty low. Perhaps people were shorter in the 1930s. Uh, what I did like was the kind of balance of uh, elevation plan, because Des and I have the same problem in arc res, is that people keep drawing plans and don't spend long enough on the elevations and the section, and that's the bit you see, mostly. And I hadn't been aware of the sculpture uh, when I was a kid. Who remembers Mr. Potato Head? <laughs> yeah. I reckon they got it from Corb, ripped him off. So, uh, let's talk three-dimensional now, rather than orthographic, because um, Corb moved on. This is Ronchamp. Um, where's my cursor? There we go. Yeah, there's a great little bed and breakfast somewhere in here on the on this little... Creek, babbling brook, I think they called it. it was a big drain, really. But anyway, um, yeah, I woke up in the morning, went downstairs because I arrived late, and uh, had breakfast in the breakfast room with French doors that opened out because it's an 18th century French house. And straight up, there's Ronchamp. I should have put a photo in. You have to imagine it. Yeah, yeah. God, it was tough. Uh, and then, if you're sensible, you take the pilgrim's walk up from the township. You can't drive. There's a car park, um, which is pretty awful, the car park. The renovation uh, by Renzo Piano is not too bad. But I was there to see uh, the chapel, um, and I just immediately thought, you know, this is just a skin on the building, this textured skin and began to kind of look at it for signs of age. Because when you get to my age, that's what happens. The skin takes a bit of a beating. Uh, and just a kind of appreciation of the detail and the, um, yeah, the three-dimensional character and the quality of the building. And you just want to walk around it, um, even before you want to go inside, I think.
and it looks kind of tough. And yet it's kind of friendly at the same time. I must admit I do see the skylights as uh, nuns just you know, gently going about their business quietly because it's a chapel for, for the nuns that live there. And the play of light on the surfaces um, is magnificent but also shows up the organic staining that you get in a rough skin. That's the problem with kind of stucco finishes. So you get the profiling and you read the texture, but that's through the fact that it's probably got dirt in it. And you can see the problems with a skin trying to cover that big a canvas. Um, and it cracks and moves about, and so it requires a lot of maintenance. TV aerial crucifix is a nice touch. <laughs> <laughs> Probably curious, love it. Yeah. <coughs> so how did he come up with this shape, Des? <laughs> the clever boy. <coughs> Not Noah's Ark. All right. Um, so I'm relating it back to the same problems with Charles Rennie McIntosh's harling. Um, I happened to be there in uh, 1985, I think, 86. Um, and there they were repairing it. And I actually saw a, uh, an academic paper on it at the time where they were trying to work out the right mix to actually put back on the wall because the traditional render techniques weren't working. Um, Again, you can see the beautiful detail over the top of that little window. Uh, but the harling is a low-cost stone construction, not necessarily terribly pretty, and then you cover it with a render. Um, and that's a traditional Scottish technique. Is that right, Stuart? Harling, you recognise that name? Yep. Yes? Sure. And the Macintosh was accused of using this technique um, because it was cheaper than Edwardian red brick construction so he could spend more money on the furniture. So he pushed the money around. But I don't know whether that's true or not. But the building still has function. And the yeah. the Harlan, you know, where he removed it. Yes. Yes. No, OK. Maybe I'm wrong then. But I did read that somewhere. I was quite interested in the arts and crafts it's architects. Racist, actually. Is it? It's racist. Yeah, these Scots, <laughs> they, get, they, get, they get fired up, don't they? Which I understand perfectly. <laughs> uh, my mother was Scottish, so um, I have to be. I'm allowed, I think. Um, but I liked arts and crafts architecture because of this uh, uh, interest in uh, how, how you make things, and maybe you use traditional techniques of construction. Um, and you, you, you appreciate the value of, of that effort. Um, and so I, I traipsed around the UK looking at a lot of arts and crafts architecture. Um, not only arts and crafts, I looked at high tech and all sorts of other things, but um, it's uh, still kind of really appreciated. It was difficult to um, continue though because it was labour intensive and it ended up being expensive and only wealthy people could kind of really afford the, the best examples of it, um, and so it struggled. Um, so back to Ronchamp, and there's also concrete cancer. Um, so I'm not sure, again, how durable this is going to be long term. I'm sure they can work out how to fix it, but it's going to require ongoing maintenance. Um, internally, I think this is just wonderful, this building. Um, normally when you go into a chapel, you kind of, you look up, don't you? I spent most of my time walking around looking at the floor. Um, I just, I was fascinated with it and trying to work out 
Uh, but where's my cursor? The geometry of the whole thing. How you get that angle uh, between the chapels, don't know. But I, I spotted this little square here, and I wonder whether that might have had something to do with it. It looks like there's another square here, which might then have uh, an extension of the radius of the square to that point there. And then there's another square over there, I think, too. So at some stage when I've got time, uh, in the near future, I might have another look at this. Because I've seen a number of drawings where people have tried to work out the geometry of the plan. And I find that challenging because I haven't been convinced. But internally, uh, it's a hard floor, mostly, except for the little area of pews, okay, which is just pointing at the screen, then I should use this bit here, which is quite small. Because it's just, I think, for the population of nuns. Is that right, Des? For, for most services? Possibly. Yeah. It's a pilgrimage chapel, so hmm. it's not a weekly chapel. No. But there are nuns living there. There's a nunnery hidden <coughs> now under the hill by Jean Privé. And I love the door. Well, most people walk around the other side and come in the other door. Was that door open while you were there? No, it wasn't open. I think that's the ceremonial door. Ah, uh, okay. Big, uh, special occasions. Yeah. It wasn't special enough. <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> um, and it's just uh, it's an amazing space. That the kind of dark roof doesn't kind of feel heavy. And there's a sense of kind of uh, elevation and almost elation, I suppose, when you go in there. Because you get this wall of sculpted light, uh, which I've not seen anywhere else. And it feels like it's just carved out of, you know, a cave. But this will tell you it's a lie. It's all lightweight or lightish. <coughs> you can see the concrete fins in your photo at the top. Yeah. <coughs> yes. So the roof is held clear of the wall, and the shaft of light comes in underneath. So it's not really a load-bearing wall at all. I think he's tried to cram all of the possibilities I can think of for making openings. It's not really a window as wall, as in a curtain wall, is it? <coughs> but I think he has a go at the others. And Unwin talks about uh, this building is dealing with shadows and, and, and light as a way of, I guess, reading the materiality and the space and the form. Um, and it kind of opens up that whole discussion about um, how do we understand tectonics, particularly visually. Uh, without light, of course, we can't. Um, but beyond that, uh, the way you might use it uh, adjust your perception of the building and maybe the meaning of the building. And I just hung around all day, basically, and kept hoping all the other people who I thought were a bit noisy to leave. And I had periods of maybe up to half an hour when there was no one in there. And uh, the silence was actually magnificent. So I won't forget it for a long time. Um, Thinking about that, I came across this book. I don't know if any of you have had a look at it. Because, they go, you know, it's all very old to say light's important. But, you know, what is that? Is it all the same? Uh, I don't think so. And I found this attempt by Henry Plummer, looking at Scandinavian architecture, to actually characterise different types of light. Because I think that's going to help your uh, tectonic understanding of a building. 
Yes? And you might need to clarify what you mean by light coming into the building. What's it doing? I'd never thought of like that. I just thought, hey, daylight, you know. Light, light. Morning sun, afternoon sun. You know, passive soul again. And, ha. Didn't understand much at all. And so we're in Finland now with Kevin Huey on the Archie Nerd Tour 2016. I think he toned it down for me, being a bit older. But boy, he goes at a pace. So go on one of the tours uh, once you've had a good rest, not straight after Project Doc submission. But well worth it because he knows so much, uh, more than me, and I think you should get him to do a, a real lecture. You're late. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, some things don't change. No. <laughs> uh, this is a cemetery. <coughs> Just because I'm retiring doesn't mean I'm dead yet. But uh, There are two projects here. Um, and so I went through Henry Plummer's book because he talks about both of them, interestingly. And Kevin and I just went there because Kevin knew what he was doing and I followed. And we got out of the car and I thought, oh, this is a bit gruesome. But then I saw a headstone for Saren and I thought, oh, we're probably in the right place. I'm not sure if it's a relative or not. I don't think so. I think it's a common name. And there's uh, a funeral chapel by Eric Brigman on the copper roof. And there's a bell tower not attached to the building. And there's the door handles and the entrance for the people who were living and the entrance for the people who were dead. And I'd known about this building from Simon Unwin's book for a long time. I'd actually been using it and you know, talking to first and second year students in Tectonic Studio about, you know, making space and hey, you break the rules. You know, here's Eric, he can take a Christian church and not do the crucifix, you just, you know, cut off one side. It's not quite cut off. We'll get back to that later. But that's all I knew, really. And then we opened the doors and I realised where I was. <laughs> that was wonderful. <coughs> and there it is of a church or chapel on one side and that's by a shop front on the other. <laughs> yeah, that's breaking the rules, isn't it? And yet you realise, of course, you're looking out into nature. Yeah, and it's quite strong light from that side, but it doesn't seem to upset the light balance in the rest of it, which is the amazing thing, because you think it'd just blow all the other subtlety out the window, excuse my pun, but it doesn't. I'm assuming these are for, you know, flower wreaths and things like that, are they, to sit on, not just stop kids playing. I'm not sure why they've got the plants there to cover up the fact that it's an empty space. I think it's meant to be empty. And there's this fairly secure looking area to sit down but it's not perpendicular to the axis. So you can sit in your pew and without turning your head too far, you can look out the window. Which when I went to church as a little kid, you weren't allowed to do that. You had to pay attention. And you get this magnificent forest garden setting to contemplate I guess, what you're doing and why you're there. And maybe listen to the ceremony. Uh, there's the organ up the back. A 
effort to chip in here. Now, Des and start talking about the character of that surface. Pretty good, isn't it? I like the ripple in the wall. If you do the previous shots, you can see the ripple. Of yeah, yeah, Des, you're a, you're a slide ahead of me. There you go. Why would you do that? Eric thought it was important. And I think that's the kind of other part of the crucifix that was cut off this fairly firm doorway in the Maya shop front to take you back out into the garden. And there's even the wrought iron motif. It's probably brass rather than wrought iron. And uh, you can see the interesting uh, cut in the floor to get down to the level outside, inside the building rather than outside. And there the uh, heating vents just drilled in the floor, travertine floor. And so you go back through the forest and you go over to the chapel for the crematorium. And the car park is kind of well out of the way, just in off the road. And then you meander up through the landscape to get to the building. If you can't walk because you're dead, you get taken up the right-hand side. Am I being too blunt? <laughs> Fortunately, with these places, there's a live side and there's a dead side, which I think is really carefully orchestrated. In, uh, in the plan. You can see the two chapels, one a bit larger than the other, and the separation um, in the plan for the service area is right in the middle of the building. And you kind of come in the front and you go left or you go dog leg round to the right. Um, so it's quite a nice plan, but there's this large portico separated from the building, which comes out to meet you. Looks a bit like a builder's square. Um, supported on single columns, a concrete roof. And I just thought the articulation of this uh, was important. But I think the idea that light might be tranquil, um, I think, really does apply to this building. I don't know the architects at all. I don't know if anyone else knows them. Um, we were just there and Kevin said, oh, there's another one over the other side, so let's go and look at that too. And we did. I just like the way the concrete entrance portico which is pretty brutal, um, is supported on the single columns, but then joins back to the building. So this bit stabilises it, of course. But that suffits quite low. So it brings you in, I imagine, calms you down, and brings you through the doorway. And there's a kind of relationship with the projection of the doorway. I don't know if it's actually precise, Des. We were talking about this before, I think, where it lines up with the mat recess. <coughs> no. In Arc Res, we're very keen on mat recesses being part of the orchestration. Because um, if it's going to be there, um, it better fit. It's pretty close. To it's pretty close. And we also think that the vents for the heating system near the cold wall turn a standard width of paver, uh, floor, floor stone, into something that frames the columns inside almost in the middle. Not quite. Been looking at it closely, Des. I don't think it's perfect. You need to get them to do another drawing. They're giving a better score than called tiles in the land. I think so. Yeah, they're doing pretty well. <coughs> and then you go into the large chapel, and the light quality is just uh, amazing. It is crazy. <coughs> um, it's quite dark in the bit where you sit. Um, I imagine also these hooks are for where you put the wreaths as well. I don't think they're coat hooks. But it's a cold climate. I'm pretty sure there's a cloak room outside. And so they're bathed in light. But you're in the space and you can't see where the light's coming from at this point. So you're not tempted to try and look out. Of course, I couldn't help it. I had to go over and pick my camera up and have a look. And that's what's happening. I'm pretty sure the artificial lighting along the right-hand side will give you a similar effect at night. So it's pretty nifty. Now 
And of course, that's where the coffin gets raised and lowered. Um, and this this subtle step up to the altar. And the separation of the light hitting the altar. So there's an opening for that light to come past the altar, but it's separated from you. You can't see the window. So you don't get that window. And then you get these shafts of light at the top. Uh, the wall's made of precast concrete. Great big beefy tiles. What about the appendage made a mistake in the top right corner? Uh, well, I've, I was looking at that. There's a, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I, yeah, they got sick of just da 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 da. <laughs> Someone started whistling. Yeah. Got a square in there. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, you can do a drawing of the geometry of that wall for us, Des, next week. Um, you look the other way, of course, and you're back out into the garden. But there's that strong separation of the window, which from the bit where you're sitting, you cannot see out, but it bays the altar in, in light. And that play of sort of light and then dark in the space is really quite powerful. Did you and Kevin bring plants with you? I, I, yeah, it's, yeah, it's it's tricking me. I'm going, what what are they doing? You, you've got that view beyond. It's magnificent. What? what the <laughs> 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 I just wanted to put them outside, you know, hide them behind a tree, <laughs> see if they noticed. But the, uh, the wish I was in Mexico. <laughs> Plants is. <laughs> uh, well, the the fin. Palms. Are they finished palms? Are they okay? Yeah, it's pretty cold in Finland, and <coughs> anything that sort of makes you think it's not cold is a good thing. And slowly but surely, your eyes adjust, and you start picking up the subtlety in the variation in texture, and you can read the kind of structural concrete which is formed and has timber lining in the formwork. Uh, compared to the infill walls. And they're not quite perfect, and so you get, with the light coming down right beside the wall, um, you, you, you get that sense of the surface. And you don't need to decorate it, you don't need to paint it, you don't need to do anything to it, you just leave it. Okay. Is that the curved front one that's battered? The big fat column. Yeah. In the previous shot, is that the curved thing? Yeah. It's actually slightly back. Oh, it could be just my inaccurate use of the wide angle lens. I may have deformed it, this. Yeah? Because yeah. that, that hides the stair up to the, for the organist. And so you begin to read the materiality as your eyes, your eyes adjust and uh, just the attention to a kind of fairly brutish material. And if you get even closer, like I do, uh, they've paid reasonable attention to the character of the lining of the formwork, which is fine inside. And I, the danger is everybody goes up and touches it. Yeah, and it gets dirty gradually. And I couldn't see any marks on the walls. Maybe the fins, you know, have learned to resist touching the concrete. Well, I don't know. But I couldn't detect any uh, patina of use in the building. Okay? Normally with a, a tough building like this, with everything, just leave it as it is, it's pretty hard to stop that. You know, even people's shoes and things like that on the floor, I couldn't detect it. Um, outside, it was a slightly different story. When I got closer from a distance, I loved this uh, canopy, um, but you could see the spout from the roof is just not quite throwing the water far enough. And so some of the Rio is starting to suffer. Okay. Um, how's the time going? I've lost track of time. It's nearly time to stop. All right. Uh, Panu. Anyone been to Panu in Estonia? They had a little tennis tournament. You can see the tennis courts. <laughs> they were there, the red brick dust courts, um, clay courts. 
Uh, I hope you didn't go for a swim in the river so you couldn't follow it. No, but it's a very famous beach. Very, very famous beach at Parnu for women swimming naked. <laughs> and there are signs everywhere that you have to respect their right to swim naked at this beach. Yeah, it seems to be everyone's happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> Including the women. <laughs> but because I was there, um, why was I there? Because the, t the <laughs> world <laughs> wasn't the beach. I didn't know about the beach until I walked on the beach. Um, the World Championships were in Helsinki. Um, so that was fantastic. But because of the semesters, and I had to fit in the four weeks between semesters, I arrived a bit early. And so I looked up, well, you know, is there a tournament nearby? Get a bit of practice. Um, which even at my age is important. And there was one in Estonia. And I thought, here's a go. <laughs> Would never have thought of going to Estonia. It's just that it's very easy to get to from Helsinki. The ferries go across to Tallinn. And of course, that's magnificent. Didn't get bombed during the war. So it's a beautiful city. And it was a short bus ride. I think an hour, or maybe an hour and a half down from Tallinn to Panu. And stayed in a 1930s Russian Wassa hotel, or Bassa hotel, which is, you know, it was a lot of fun. Biggest dining room I've ever seen. Everyone has their breakfast, lunch, and dinner together. It was kind of like a spa or health resort, which was popular at the time. But the Finns and the Estonians get on very well. And I was just wondering about the town because, you know, the architecture was kind of interesting, even though I think Panu is quite, quite young. And I just spotted in the distance this shimmering thing in the trees. And I uh, thought, oh, I better go and look at that. And as I got closer, it just got better. Because I had just arrived at absolutely the right time of day. Yeah, you come most, you know, 20 three and a half hours of the day and you just don't see this and I just turned up at the right time. And I go, how are they doing that? And it's really simple. And it's just the light hitting the ends of the bricks. And you get that. And you know, you put it amongst the trees and you get that. It's just a sports hall. I don't know these architects either, but I was really impressed. But you just got to ask the brickies. Yeah, no, we don't want you to lay them straight this time. I know we made you pull the wall down on the last job because you're out of alignment. This time, we want them out of alignment. <coughs> Do you reckon one of the partners got hit with a brick? <laughs> you are come they, on. Are they clay bricks? They look very strange. Uh, I don't know. They're a bit I imperfect, aren't they? Mm. They look like they don't have baked faces on them. No, they don't. <coughs> There's another research project for you, Des. Do you speak Estonian? Get another one. Uh, back to Helsinki. Um, fascinating. There's a little chapel in one of the busiest parts of Helsinki. So it's just been kind of put in the corner of this shopping square, really, surrounded by shops and pubs and restaurants and things like that. And someone decided to put a chapel of silence in uh, an interesting location. And I just happened to be in the hotel room and that was my view, straight across the square. Hotel Presidente. And so I could see the roof, which was handy. <coughs> and it's got this really interesting use of timber. Um, and I guess we're getting to the kind of last project I wanted to talk about because um, this is more durable, I think, in terms of what we use to build. 
So, you know, you shouldn't be able to get a building permit until you've grown your own building materials on your own site. Then you have a building permit. That'd be sustainable, wouldn't it? We wouldn't have the rate of development and consumption of resources that we have now. But the Scandinavians are starting to use timber in a big way. Um, I had a research student some years ago, uh, Andrea Sandlin, who came out. Um, she was from a construction area, not architecture. And she did a thesis uh, with me. And she compared the forest industries of, of Sweden, her country, and Australia and determined they're about the same size. She was quite interested in the development of sustainable products, you know, uh, building materials. And uh, she was actually doing the research because the people in Scandinavia wanted to know and she thought you'd have better access to information here. Um, and she wrote a really good thesis. But our the forest industry, timber industry, is about the same size as Sweden. Um, but they're starting to use uh, timber in a big way, and I could have shown more projects, but you know there, there wasn't time. But I just like this little building, um, just the whole idea that you just kind of make a timber bowl and uh, stick it against something completely different, okay? Because the plan is the the bit off to the left when it goes into another building, which is an undercroft uh, for a, a plaza, but it's a car park entry. So right beside the Chapel of Silence, there's people belting in and out of the underground car park because it's a huge shopping, shopping centre. But to make that shape fairly carefully, I think they've done a good job. Um, we probably approve of the way they meet the ground desk by allowing for the fl fall in the pavement and you keep the timber out of the moisture. And the, the curve tops hard when you start doing flashings, but they use a lot of copper, um, which they got from the Russians. They've stopped doing it so much now. And you can see the little kind of, once again, the sleight of hand that you can't, when you're in there, you can't really see the windows. You can't see the where the light comes from, and it washes down the timber wall. It's very warm, and it is quiet in there because of the thickness of the timber. Very quiet space until other people come in and make noise. And the only thing I didn't like was the doors, the kind of the, the, the solidity of the shape, the completeness of it. Just I just because they had to put you know doors in and doors on that slope. You know how do you, how do you open them? Just the geometry of making a door, unless you just kind of slide the whole wall, like in the Flintstones. And so they put them in, and of course the obligatory exit sign. They at least carved the handle into the door, which was good. Can you see how I see the detail and just go, yeah. breaks down? Because that's, that's complete, isn't it, in a way? And then you, you get around the other side, and there's, uh, there's the doors. It'd be better if, 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 if the shape kind of went like that and gave you a, a space that you walked out of the space to get to the doors. They weren't in the space. It's not the same height either, so. No, it's either. unfortunate, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. From my room, I could see the roof, which was, which was good, because it's intriguing otherwise, because you have no idea what the roof is. And there it is. It's kind of flat, and it's got uh, duck boarding covering, basically shower base roof but I'm absolutely puzzled because the duckboarding is kind of drawn here to be the same level uh, you can see the kind of membrane roofs but the glazing slopes to the inside which is in the middle I couldn't understand that for a start surely you take that glazing to the outside this is the project doc person speaking and of course, they've got to get the water out of the shower base. Where's my cursor? There. See, there's a, an outlet. So it drains away from the edge there to an outlet. And this is all just duck boarding on sections on upstands, covered with the membrane, and then you put bearers on top of that. And the water comes out, 
and goes out through the beam, I think. And then down. So to get that purity of shape, here yeah, I go, how do you, how do, you do that? Because you know, when you look up and there was a gap, there was nothing there, there was just the beams going out. Unless they were false and there was a cavity beside the beam, I don't know. I'm still trying to work that out because there's the structure. And they feel like they're about the same thickness as the bit that you could see in the window. So I'm going, where's the water? Where's the, where's the pipe? Probably, because they're pretty beefy, laminated timber beams. And I started to think it's a shame to go to all that trouble and then not reveal them. But they just framed between them like a boat and made the building. So in the section, unlike a boat, did the downpipe just fill up the walk, walk area? Well... It, it looks awfully like that, doesn't it? <laughs> I imagine it goes somewhere. Because the base of the wall's got a drain in it, according to the floor section. It does. Or, no, no, that's, I think that's a... I'm pretty sure that's a heating system. Yeah, I think that's the heating system. Maybe it's hot water. <laughs> Maybe they collect it in the wall and they... Yeah, okay. All right. Um, okay, so I, I think Unwin's right. Um, to understand uh, spatial fabric, um, you've got to compose the solid and the void. Um, and the suggestion in his book, and just a couple of little diagrams, I've always you know, thought this was important. I've shown it to a lot of students, and some of them look at me strangely, that you draw the solid thing, and then you draw the thing without the solid, to look at both of them, so that any projection or hole in the solid bit becomes something you focus on. Yeah, and so in a thick wall, uh, those spaces in the wall, the reveals, um, might be useful space and elaborate the space. So these Welsh knew quite a bit. The Scots don't like the Welsh, do they? They're all right. <laughs> Okay, as always with my lectures, there's further reading. <laughs> um, okay, what I haven't done is talk about my buildings because um, there's no time. Um, I guess I was going to say what I'll miss, I think, about uh, what I've been doing here is being able to take uh, some of the stuff I learnt in practice and, in fact, building this house entirely. Um, had a bricklayer, a plumber, uh, and an electrician. And a mature age student who helped me with the slab, Alan Barnes. And then I built the rest. And I did the roofing, which is illegal, of course. And getting the uh, flashing. I like the idea of flashings being at 90 degrees, a 45 degree rear, just beautiful. Because you don't have to worry about the, you know, roll top because it's firm enough. Snows heavily. <laughs> now, I just come back from uh, my arts and crafts tour in the UK. And I used to go to the big, you know, country houses and mansions. And I always spent all my time looking at the gatehouse. This little, you know, nice upright building, small footprint, leave plenty of garden. Um, so I, you know, read my Gertrude Jekyll books carefully. Um, yeah, and I, and I built it. It took a long time. I was slow. I never built anything other than, you know, a coffee table at woodwork at school. But I knew where things should go, and I studied the framing manual really carefully. And I managed to put it up. But getting the ridge capping on, back to the ridge capping, because when you're putting that bit on, you can't have a ladder that hooks over the roof. I nearly died several times. I didn't have, you know, oh and s <laughs> approval. I'm lucky I'm here. It's amazing I got to live this long. But the only way I could get it on without pulling it or crimping, I had, had to straddle the roof. And, you know, like in a good canter or, or what is it, where you use your knees to lift yourself off the seat so I could straighten it, fix it, and then sit down again. I don't know why I thought of that, but, oh, that was hard. Two storeys, three storeys up. 
I scared the crap out of myself. Hey? You only fall once. <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I nearly did. I watched the drill drop through the frame once and hit the concrete. S smash. Air guard. Oh, you can't walk on 45 degrees in anything. 30, 30 degrees. Even then they're standing on the screws, you know, get a little bit of traction. I had a little ladder. I made up a ladder, hook up over the ridge. <coughs> Climbed up that. Um, okay, what I'm going to miss is taking stuff that I kind of knew and turning it into research. This is where I evaluated the performance of the house for Anzeska. Um, to see where it's stacked up okay, taking into account the um, embodied energy uh, and also the um, fuel, uh, of using timber in the fuel and electric floor and things like that. Um, so to be able to explain it, I guess, in terms of what I was trying to do as uh, a passive solar buff, um, I'm going to miss telling people about project-specific information and why it's difficult to do documentation because you've got to pull all this together. Um, I'm going to miss students that really surprise you with fantastic work. Um, I recall talking with a student, how do you draw the um, bamboo so that you don't just line up all of the knuckles? in the bamboo, is that what you call them? Because they don't grow evenly. Yeah, when you put bamboo in a wall, you don't get that kind of precision. And so she tested different ways and she just, on the computer, because you know you just want to go bang, 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 bang with the computer, just draw one and then repeat. Yeah, so she found a way of adjusting the length of them on one and then staggering that to get the effect in the drawing, which I thought was really good. And so you, you remember things like that. Um, I'm, I'm really going to miss making things. Um, it's gotten harder, but we used to do one-to-one -one building 10 years ago. But numbers have changed, and OHS has made it impossible. We used to get in trouble for putting dust on the vice chancellor's chair, uh, car in the car park. <sighs> anyway. <laughs> and things flowing from that, thinking about materials and, uh, you know, Bob Fuller comes along and says, let's have a look at renewable materials. And my contribution, I think, was this iceberg diagram. And I think he did just about the rest. Um, and we produced a paper on that. Um, unfortunately, this won't go any further because Bob passed away just recently, which is incredibly sad. Um, and out of that... Uh, we even encouraged students to take it further and they did some wonderful work. Um, this student, Wayne, just went off and started to try and find suppliers of different kinds of renewable material because what we discovered is everyone knows about timber and everything else is not well known and is not readily available uh, in the marketplace and so people aren't using it. Uh, I'm going to miss people doing work like this, uh, analysing good work and are trying to understand it. Um, so I used to run a unit on architectural language, information transfer by design. Um, things change. Oh, yeah, I'm going to miss Project Doc, most of all. But it's not all bad. Uh, this is my bucket list for this year, maybe. Uh, who knows? I don't know if I can get to cast a mallet apart, unless I break in or swim. Um, and I, I thought you guys might make some suggestions, because I'll be around uh, Germany maybe in August. haven't booked yet. <coughs> but I was hoping to go and see something of Peter Zumptor, and if I can get across to Italy, I would love to go and look at Mario Botta, who sort of did the masonry... Uh, construction without feeling the need to render it. I think he should have, you know, had a word with Paul. <laughs> and that's me, the country club. <laughs> oh, that was tough. Tell you what. And the 
those New Zealanders, they'd get around too. All right, I'm done.